Hey folks, today we've got a complete user guide, beginner's guide, whatever you want to call it, for the Garmin Epix Pro Series. Now, I've been using this watch for quite a while, so I've got a lot of good tips and tricks, kind of like pro tips and tricks, as well as like beginner stuff. I'm going to cover the whole gamut of things, starting right now. Though, before I do that, I should mention this video is sponsored by the Pros Causer, or TPC. More about them a little later on in the video. Now, these are the three different sizes of the Garmin Epix Pro. You've got the 42 here, the 47, and the 51. This is notable because up until the Pro series of the Epix, there was only this middle size right there. There weren't the two larger sizes like there was in the Phoenix 7 series. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Also, keep in mind, this is not a review video. That video is up in the corner there. This is more of a user guide video. Now, in under 30 seconds, the main difference between the Phoenix 7 series that you see right here, let's get these two other ones out of the way. We don't need these right now. Put them over there. We're just going to use this 47. They're identical from a feature standpoint between the three sizes. The only difference is simply battery life and display size. That's, that's it. Uh, now, right here, this is the Epix Pro and this is the Phoenix 7 Pro. The singular difference between these two watches is, well, it's actually the same thing. It's battery life as well as display size. So I guess that's really two differences. Uh, but the biggest like visual difference is the display. So on the Phoenix series over here, you've got what's called a MIP display, or MIP. Uh, so basically, it's a display that lasts a lot longer. It's always on. Like, you can see that's always on. In a couple seconds over here, this display will turn off on the Epix. Now, the Epix display is always on as well. At least you can set it that way, which is how I use it, as long as it's on your wrist, because it senses your body and knows that there's something, something live there. But here on the table, it turns off the display to save battery life. Uh, now, generally speaking, the AMOLED displays are far more vibrant, far more pretty, if you will. Uh, kind of reminds you of like an Apple Watch display or a Samsung Watch display. Uh, those displays uh, do burn more battery, though, uh, versus on the Phoenix series, those displays tend to be a little bit dimmer, uh, but they have a lot longer battery life. In terms of visibility, one of the key things to remember is there's a lot of information out on the internet about older AMOLED displays, like technology just two to three years ago that was not nearly as good outside as the new AMOLED displays. Uh, from myself using the Epix Pro as well as the Epix before it on the same AMOLED display, I've got no issues. I, you know, worn this watch like middle of summer hiking in the Alps to middle of summer on beaches all around the world and no problems with like full screen visibility. Uh, the one caveat though is if you do plan to put this on your bike handlebars, uh, that won't work. So it'll shut off just like it is right here because it didn't detect a live body. But you need something like a MIP based display. And this is actually true of all AMOLED displays out there. Uh, but for every other scenario, I've had no problems with the AMOLED display and in fact prefer it especially living in a kind of cold, dark place, uh, being the Netherlands uh, most of the year. Generally speaking, an AMOLED display is far easier to see uh, in those dark conditions. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk about the basics of the watch. So right here is the watch face. You can customize everything on this watch face by simply long holding right there to the left. Uh, you choose watch face, and you can go on down, you can change your watch face. These are some of the stock ones, the ones that are built into the Epix Pro, uh, but you can also add your own from the Garmin Connect IQ app. You can see a couple examples here on the screen on this, and then every single component on this can be changed as well. So I can tap this upper right hand button uh, and go down to data, and then from there I can choose you know, what I want in this top one. This is my current elevation. I can say, you know what, I don't really want that. I want VO2 max or uh, anything else here, steps, battery life, etc. cetera. Uh, and again, all these things, there's a lot of different components there, uh, and you can change all of the different components. Uh, so I'm going to back out of that. I like what I have right now, so no thank you. Uh, and then you can see accent color, data color. I mean, again, a lot of stuff you can tweak here if you want to. So backing out to the wash face right there, I'm going to go ahead and press down once. And you see, these are my widget glances. Uh, so training readiness, endurance score, hill score. And we're going to talk about all this stuff in depth later on, what, again, works well and what, what falls a little bit short. And there's some things that fall short there. Uh, training status unproductive. I'm, I'm unproductive right now. And, and I'll explain why. And actually, it makes a lot of sense when you hear why once I get into those steps there. Uh, but speaking of steps, so here's a good example of a widget glance. Uh, and keep in mind, all of these are customizable. So you can change the order. You can choose which ones you want or don't want. Uh, but once you tap into one of these, you can see this is a larger view of that same thing. This is showing my steps since midnight. So again, it's only uh, 10 in the morning here, so not that many steps yet. I can choose down once. I can see the steps over the last seven days. Uh, and I can see here my distance over the last seven days. Uh, and so basically, each one of those widget glances can be expanded into a bigger widget to see more information about it. I can go back here. I can look at sunset, for example, or sunrise. Uh, and you can see, again, I can tap down to this. 
uh, and I can see all sorts of crazy different views and options. So this is loading up the map and showing me where the sun is going to be relative to me. So the page you probably never even knew existed on a Garmin, but it's there. Uh, and again, the same thing here for my calendar, notifications, and so on. Uh, and if I go down to the very bottom here, uh, you can see edit. Uh, and then from here, I can choose the order of all the different glances. Or I can go down even further, keep on going down, down, down. And then there's the add screen to go ahead and add more glances that I don't currently have. And there's also Connect IQ, which is the development platform uh, so that third-party apps can leverage. You can put different widget glances from there. I can create folders for widget glances. Uh, all that is here that I can do and customize as I see fit. Uh, and I do customize this. So for example, in my case, I like to see training readiness at the top, uh, my endurance and hill score, my training status, and so on. And then I can kind of tweak that. Uh, now, as I've been doing this, I probably haven't mentioned the buttons in kind of the touch screen and whatnot. So, there are three buttons on the left-hand side and two buttons on the right-hand side. Garmin is known for their five-button layout, and most athletes find that like works great. I know it can be a little intimidating when you come from a pure touchscreen device, but once you get used to it, you can navigate so fast, you don't need to use a touchscreen. That's the kind of the core thing about Garmin's stance on touchscreens is that you can choose one or the other or both wherever you want. So you can say, you know what? I want to use buttons all the time, but sometimes I want to use a touch screen. So if I want to take my finger, I can go ahead and do this. I can swipe through something. I can say, I'm going to tap on my notifications, open that up, uh, do it again here, tap this and open it up. There we go. Uh, and again, you can do that. And it generally works pretty well, both in dry conditions and wet conditions. Like any touch screen, there's a couple of occasional missed uh, taps in wet conditions. But the idea being that if you like doing touch on all this stuff, you can do touch for everything except starting activity and pressing the lap button. So starting is this upper right hand button there and lap button is this button right there. But everything else you can do via touch or inversely, if you wanna turn off touch, you can do that as well. So if I go back here, so I'm back into the main page, left hand middle button, Go on down, and I'm going to find the touch option in uh, settings. There we go. So system, and then we'll go down to touch. Uh, and you can see general use, it's on. So that's things like the widget glances and stuff like that. During activity, uh, or I have it set right now for map only, but you can have it be on, you can have it be off. And if I go down, uh, during sleep, it's auto, meaning it's going to basically go into a special sleep mode that we'll dive into in a little bit as well. Uh, what's cool about during activity, though, is that you can have this be on a per sport profile basis. So you can say, you know what, I want touch when I'm hiking for maps, for example, uh, and maybe for some other sports, but I don't want touch when I'm swimming, which it's going to be off by default there anyways, or I don't want touch when I'm running. Now you can, again, you can tweak all this stuff on a per sport activity profile, which is pretty handy. And actually, a really quick note as well, if you are finding this video interesting or useful, if you could just give it a quick like or a subscribe, it really does help out this video quite a bit, especially these really big, long videos. Uh, so going on back up here to the top, let's go into a couple more of the activity tracking widgets, and most notably, sleep. So I'm going to go down, I'm going to find my sleep one right there. Where is my sleep? Have I added this? I have not. So it's a great option to add that. So we'll go to edit. We'll go down to the very, very bottom, and then we'll choose add. And I'll choose down at the very bottom. These are all the widget glances you can add by default. We'll go down, we'll find sleep. There we go, and I've got sleep. So I'm gonna back out to this, back out again, and there's sleep. So this is my sleep uh, from last night, six hours and 15 minutes, a sleep score of 74. And these little dotted lines, those are showing my sleep stages or sleep phases. Uh, so you can see here, that sleep score, it's shorter than ideal, but it was calm sleep. But that's a fairly good representation of it. Uh, no small children came into the bedroom last night, so that was good. Uh, you can sleep, or you can see here these sleep stages. I generally don't put much stock into sleep stages or sleep phases from really any wearable. Uh, the, even the, like the pro level um, technology isn't that accurate in the grand scheme of things, topping out 80, maybe even 90% in very slim uh, clinical settings. Even that's very, very slim. Most of it tops around 80 or so percent. Uh, so uh, from a wearable standpoint, it just isn't super useful, which is unfortunate because there's other data like training readiness and other things on those areas that do depend on this data. Uh, but, you know, some of these messages do tend to be correct, like I mentioned earlier on there. And you can see my sleep scores right there, kind of all over the map, a bunch of travel the last uh, three weeks. Uh, so it's been kind of everywhere, sleep stages, and so on. So backing out here, these are the sleep stages bits there. Uh, and we've talked about the widget tracking and all that kind of goodness. 
Uh, now, I want to mention the weather widget because this is super interesting. But before that, I do want to note today's sponsor, which is the Pros Closet or TPC. Now, what's cool is I actually just visited the Pros Closet's headquarters uh, just outside of Boulder, Colorado last week. Uh, an incredible facility. They've got thousands and thousands of bikes in stock and all sorts of bikes. So like road bikes and gravel bikes and mountain bikes. And my wife's been eyeing this triathlon bike here. She just finished her first Ironman this weekend, uh, picked up a ticket to Kona as well. And now she's looking at that going, she might need a new bike and that could be her bike there. We'll, we'll have to see about that. And the way it works is that when you're ready to go ahead and get a new bike, you sell your existing bike to them and then you can either receive a credit or just straight up cash and then go find another bike that you want on the list. In fact, that's what I did. I wouldn't have found myself a gravel bike. When I was there, I got to see how the whole process works. The bikes come off the loading dock that you shipped it to them. They check all the components. Then they've got master mechanics that run through things. They replace components if components need replacing. Uh, they validate, they test it. Even have a test track that you can see there and then it gets put in a box ready to go. And beyond that, they've also got a gazillion components. So not just bikes, but also watches and bike computers. In fact, if you use the link down below with the coupon code in the screen, you will go ahead and save 40 bucks off any purchase, $200 or more. Once again, thanks to the Pros Closet for being a longtime sponsor of the channel here. I appreciate it. This is one of the new features of the Epix Pro and Phoenix 7 Pro. And it is coming to the Phoenix 7 and Epix series, the rest of the units out there. So don't worry about that. Uh, but it's coming up later on the summer. So the weather widget by itself, this is like normal weather widget stuff that you have seen in the past, but there is a new weather maps. So if I go down here, there we go. That's where my location is right now. So I'm first gonna go ahead and just zoom in. So I'm gonna choose pan zoom. I'm gonna zoom back down a little bit more so it's not quite so far away. There we go. Uh, and then you can see this little timer at the top is moving along. I'm gonna then choose to change overlay. So there are a couple different overlay options, precipitation, cloud coverage, temperature, or wind. Uh, it's a very sunny day today. Uh, it's not supposed to rain. So I'm just gonna choose temperature because that'll be a better way to show this. Give us a couple seconds to enumerate and download the data from my phone. So this does require that your phone be within range to go ahead and get this data in there. Okay, there we go. And we can see this is basically the heat data over the course of the day. This is not a very fast process in the grand scheme of things. One of the downsides of this though, is it's only accessible within the weather widget and not directly from your sport activity profile. So if you're just doing a workout, you have to get back to the weather, weather widgets, the weather widgets uh, to go ahead and see this. But I'll show you a cool trick for doing that right now. So I'm just gonna go back here real quick, back on your home screen. Doesn't really matter where you are, but this is a new feature in the Epix Pro, which is you can write long hold or long hold this lower right hand button right there. And this is a kind of a quick access menu, two different widgets. So if I go down or back up, sorry, you'll see there's the weather widget. It'll go ahead and it'll show the most recently used widget at the top and then kind of move its way on down. And then I can tap on this and boom, I'm right back to the weather widget and down to the bottom to go ahead and see those map overlays. So again, this is useful if you're somewhere else in the watch, like a workout or something like that. Now, alongside the sleep tracking, what's gonna happen every single morning when you wake up is the so-called morning report. You can see a little video of this on the screen right now. Essentially, as you wake up each morning, you're gonna see a good morning message. You're gonna show the weather on there, and that weather actually matches outside. It's kind of a really cool, nice little touch uh, in terms of also like, the brightness levels, like it's really well done. A lot of nuance to this little image. Uh, but if you go down from there, you can customize each one of these kind of data pages. It might show you, for example, your sleep last night, or it could show you uh, your calendar upcoming items, your upcoming workouts that are scheduled, either ones that Garmin automatically creates, or ones that you have from a third party uh, training plan, whether it be like from Training Peaks or Training Road or lots of other plans out there. It'll show you training readiness levels, uh, all that kind of stuff you can customize if you want to. So if you go in the left-hand side here into settings, Go on down into appearance, there we go. You can see morning report, choose that, edit report, and you can turn on and off morning report as well. If you're like, you know what, I don't want that jazz, don't, don't, you can turn it off, right? Uh, but people really love it. Like this is probably one of the most favorite features that Garmin's launched in the last year or so. Uh, and I find it just super handy to look at. Uh, you can see HRV status, you can see weather, calendar. Speaking of HRV status, let's look at that real quick. Uh, so back on the uh, watch face there, we'll go down, we're gonna find my HRV status. I don't think I have a widget set up right now on this watch for HRV status, so I'm gonna add that. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can get into it, including via training readiness. Uh, so I'm gonna go down though and add a direct HRV status one. That way it's always there. Uh, but I usually just get it via the training readiness. So I'm gonna go back here and now we see HRV status balanced. Uh, so this is the widget glance. Again, I can tap into this uh, and HRV status, HRV is your heart rate variability. It's essentially looking at uh, the timing between the heart rates uh, and seeing the variability of that. Uh, now, 
One thing to keep in mind about HRV status, might be a couple things actually. Uh, number one, it's about broad trendings over time. It's not about so much last night. Last night, yes, I was a component of that, uh, but it's about a larger kind of time scale. Uh, two, there's you know different opinions on HRV status and whether or not it should be used in a sports setting. Uh, it was historically used to figure out whether or not would someone would die in the emergency room, like to triage patients. Uh, and so now you know companies are trying to use it in a sports setting. And I think there's validity in there, but keep in mind, there's a lot of factors that can influence your HRV status. Uh, generally speaking, uh, and this will vary from person to person, including your zones. Generally speaking, though, a lower number is worse and a higher number is better. Uh, so if you have like an HRV status of, you know, 10 or 15 or 20, that isn't super awesome. That means that you're, you're having a rough, rough day in some capacity. Uh, if you have an HRV status in the 80s, 90s, or up to 100, generally speaking, that means you're probably very well recovered. I, say, I keep saying generally speaking because one of the challenges with HRV status is that people's bodies react differently. Uh, and so for some people, as you can see here, if you go super high on this list, that's actually worse. Uh, and now what Garmin does is that they develop an HRV baseline over the course of 19 days of wearing it. So this colorful little screen will not show up uh, until you have 19 nights worth of sleep. You will see some numbers there, but you won't see this basically kind of baseline being established. In my case, my baseline is 50 through 67 milliseconds. Uh, so that means that that's my green zone, my normal kind of HRV status. If I go below that, it'll become unbalanced, uh, first in the orange uh, realm. And if I go above that, it, to a certain degree, it becomes unbalanced as well, uh, meaning that I've theoretically have a too much uh, recovery. Uh, I find for me that I don't have a problem with going like, HRV balanced into the upper end. Uh, generally speaking, uh, when I get tired from you know travel, whatever the case is, I go down lower into the orange. And if I get really sick, like really, really sick, like almost going to the hospital sick, then I'll get down into the red there. Uh, I can tap down on this once. I can see last night. I can see a fairly good night for sleep for me. Uh, I had a pretty good uh, day yesterday. It wasn't too busy in the grand scheme of things, pretty calm. Uh, and then if I go down again, you can see my seven day average is ramping up. Uh, and the reason why it's you know going up there is because I was traveling a ton. I still have been traveling a ton uh, the last few weeks. And with that, with going back and forth across the Atlantic multiple times, uh, that's going to impact my HRV status because I'm getting poor sleep. Uh, and generally speaking, HRV status is influenced by uh, poor sleep. That's one. Fatigue from training is another one. Uh, you know, uh, certainly jet lag, things like that will impact it. Also heavily influenced by alcohol, uh, drugs, both like in the bad sense, but also in the, you know, good sense, uh, that will impact it as well. So lots of things can uh, change your HRV status. So just keep that in mind. If you had a big night drinking last night, uh, you might feel okay in the morning or not, uh, but your HRV status will certainly show that. And you'll actually see your HRV values burn off over the course of the night. In fact, this would be relatively similar to what you'd see that burn off, except you wouldn't get that high of values, typically speaking, for me anyways, uh, after drinking a bunch. Uh, you'll see it kind of creep around and slowly kind of maybe like the 60s or so, uh, and that'll you know impact my seven day kind of timeline. Again, like most of these metrics, you want to go ahead and you know use it, but also take it with a grain of salt. Uh, I find that this is a good kind of just trendy thing to look at and to confirm what I'm sometimes feeling. Uh, but if I'm feeling amazing and this thing's showing me poor HRV status, I'm still going to probably do my workout. So let's talk about uh, kind of a couple more like general watch features before we get into some of the sports stuff. Now, as I said, let's just tap really quick through some display options. One of the cool new things here is Redshift. Uh, so if you hold this upper left hand button like this, uh, we go down and we're going to find the Redshift icon. So that's the one that has this little like, it's got a doohickey. I don't know what you call that. It's a doohickey. And boom, I just tap it and I get Redshift. It's like submarine mode, all red, all the time. Uh, and now, this is, this is kind of a bit of like a holdover, if you will, from the tactic series uh, of years past when it was always redshift all the time. Uh, and you can turn it on off here. Uh, and you can also use this at nighttime if you want. So at nighttime, it uses redshift and daytime, it doesn't. Uh, I, I haven't really used this a ton. And the reason why is that there's already display settings that go even lower than the normal brightness uh, on this watch during the night. But again, this is like a, a filter across everything, across all apps and all components. And if you want to turn it on, it's there for you. I'm going to turn it off there real quick and show you some of those other options. So there we go. Back to normalcy here. And then back into the menu. So left-hand middle button. Go on down. We're going to find display all the way down at the bottom. So system and then display. Uh, now couple of different options here. As I mentioned earlier on, they're always on display or not. 
So always on is as the name implies, it displays always on. But by default, that doesn't happen. By default, the way it works is that when you have it on your wrist like this, it'll turn off the display when you're not facing and then turn on the display when it raises up towards you. In an always on configuration though, it'll go ahead and dim the display when it's down like this and then you just raise it up, it'll brighten brightness, it'll increase the brightness on the display. Uh, so if I look at general use right here, I've got always on display enabled. Uh, that reduces the battery life. In the case of the 47 millimeter, I'm getting about six days of battery life in always on display uh, with roughly one to two hours of GPS time per day, meaning a workout per day. So if you do less GPS time, you're gonna get more battery life, probably seven to nine days, give or take. Uh, in the case of the uh, larger unit here, uh, you're talking like 12 plus days. It's really impressive. And I, that's actually legitimately what I got. I even threw a half Ironman race in there as well and a bunch of other workouts. Super, super impressive stuff. Uh, now, there's also different brightness levels. In my case, I'm at the default, which is two thirds brightness. Uh, but you can decrease that if you want to. And in fact, there's a sleep mode that turns off the display and goes down into this really low uh, brightness mode there. One of the complaints people have had about AMOLED display watches at night, it's like, whoa, a giant flashlight. It's not an issue here because of the sleep mode. Uh, so going on down here, you can see where I can turn redshift on and off uh, during daytime. But if you look down, you see during sleep, and this is where, again, I can say, during sleep, I want it to be redshift on. I can change my timeout. I can change the brightness level. You see here, that's the quarter brightness. Uh, but there's also a sleep overlay as well. So if I go back here to the main screen, by default, what happens every night is that at a certain time of night, uh, it goes into the sleep mode. And if I tap this here, you can see the display brightness went down. And you can see it's on this really kind of dim screen there. And it doesn't maybe look uh, super dim because of all the, the lighting here. But what's nice is at night in bed, this is not like a, a bright situation. Uh, it's very, very dim. It's just there if I need it. And that sleep mode will automatically turn on or off uh, based on the timing that I have in the sleep mode settings. And it'll actually ask you to set up that sleep mode uh, timing the first time you use your watch. I'm not going to run through it right now, uh, but uh, it's, it's nice. It works pretty well. So let's talk about sport modes. Uh, the way you access sport modes is pressing this upper right hand button. You tap this and then it shows you all your sport modes. And this is the last sport mode I did yesterday, which was an open water swim. I did a run before that, but these are all my favorite modes right here. So you can see I've got run, trail run, treadmill track, triathlon, bike, bike indoors, and so on down this list here. Uh, and I keep them going down, down further. These are all sport activity profiles that I've uh, done recently down to the end of the favorites. And finally, the plus to go ahead and add more sport profiles. Uh, and a big change, arguably the biggest change, in fact, from a Garmin standpoint, is that in the Epix Pro and Phoenix 7 Pro series, they've added a boatload of new sport profiles. So you can see these are categorized here, outdoor, running, cycling, swimming, gym, etc. I can go down, like open up motorsports, for example, and I can see all these right here. Uh, and up until this series, Garmin basically had sport profiles that had some data behind them. Uh, so their competitors like Polar and Sunto had, you know, 90 to 100 sport profiles. And some of those like swimming or running uh, or cycling had unique data points within them. But some of them were just more for categorization. Uh, meaning that, you know, if you wanted to categorize for, uh, let's see, there's some snow sports here, winter sports, for example, here we go, ice skating. Uh, Sunto had a sport profile for that, Garmin did not. Uh, now, soon to a sport profile was essentially just kind of the same as like a bike profile, uh, you know, capture heart rate and pay or speed and so on, uh, but it didn't do anything special for ice skating. And a lot of people complained that Garmin didn't have, well, one, an ice skating profile, which, you know, if you lived in an ice skating country was sort of problematic, uh, but two, no way to categorize that on the watch. And so sport profiles aren't just for showing the data, but also categorizing how much time you've spent in those different given sports over time. So Garmin added 30 plus new sport profiles with the Epix Pro and Phoenix 7 Pro series. Again, those are also coming to the uh, Epix and Phoenix 7 series. And all the new features, by the way, software that I talk about are coming to the Epix and Phoenix 7 uh, units if you already have those, as well as the 955 and 965. Most of them anyways are coming to those. Uh, so these are all the new sport profiles here. And it's been funny, over the last couple months, I've done sports that I have never done before just by happenstance. There's my sport profiles. I've never water, water ski before, yet I use this water ski. And in the case of water skiing, it does actually track your runs and your speed per runs. It's super cool. I can't figure that all out. I'm horrible at water skiing, but I had one banger run for like, I don't know, a couple kilometers, whatever it says on the screen right here. Um, 
I haven't windsurfed and sailed. I did some sailing, yes, so I had that there too. Um, I went kayaking, sailed paddle boarding, uh, but I also was an ATV. I've never been an ATV before. I did that, uh, so that was cool. I did rafting with this, uh, and even did an obstacle course, a mud run. Like having profiles for all this stuff is great. And then for each of these sport profiles, again, there is some customization. In the case of obstacle racing, for example, I could have automatically marked each obstacle as I went through the course by pressing what is effectively the lap button. And then next time around that loop, it would go ahead and basically track the obstacle time automatically. Like kind of pretty cool stuff. Uh, in any case, those are all there. We're just gonna go up to running to keep this simple for now though. So back up here to run, I tap into this again. And what it's gonna show here is today's daily suggested workout. I'm just gonna cancel out of that for a second for now. And this is the basically default sports screen. And they all look pretty much the same here. Uh, so you can see at the top waiting for GPS. You can see my battery up there is 85%, uh, the time, and then it says 23 hours of GPS time in this current GPS mode. I've got the auto select or sat IQ mode, which basically means that'll go ahead and it'll ramp up the satellite based on what it needs. So in really tough conditions, it'll go to multi-band or dual frequency GPS, which burns more battery life, but has much better uh, basically GPS tracks. But when I'm out in the middle of like farmland, it'll go ahead and reduce that down and save a bunch of battery life. Uh, down the middle side here, you've got to base your settings. So run settings, I can change my data screens if I want to. Uh, these are ones I've customized there. I can press down uh, and go ahead and basically customize whatever I see fit here. Uh, so this is the uh, map overlay right there. Go down again, I can add a new one. And then within this, I can say I want custom data, for example, and you can choose the layouts. One data field all the way up to, there we go. Uh, oops, too far. Uh, eight data fields here on this watch. So pretty cool. You can customize every single one of these data fields uh, by just changing this. So I choose field one. I choose timer, distance, pace, and so on. Uh, and each one of these has dozens of fields within it. So there's, I mean, tons and tons and tons of fields here to, to work from. Uh, so cancel. Now what's notable here is you don't have to do all this configuration on the watch. You could also use your smartphone to do this. So if you open up the Garmin Connect app uh, and go into your watch settings, you can configure and change every single configuration option on the watch, except for pairing sensors and downloading maps uh, from your phone. So you can do that all there if you want to, super easy to do. Something that was introduced about a year and a half ago and people enjoy that, uh, pretty handy. Canceling back out there, we don't need to change those data fields. If I go into this again, uh, I can choose not just the uh, data fields, but alerts. I can change uh, my power mode, my metronome, my map, my routing options, auto lap, auto pause, climb pro, uh, and so on. And there's tons and tons of options here. Uh, and again, if I go down here into my, uh, let's see, satellites, I have used default. That means it's gonna use my overall default settings for satellite, which is auto select or sat IQ that I just mentioned a second ago but you could have for one sport profile, you want it to be a higher level of accuracy all the time or a lower level accuracy. Again, if you live out in the farmland, you may say, you know what? I mostly have, uh, you know, I just need GPS only. That's plenty good with great GPS tracks and I'm gonna save a ton of battery life. Uh, and I'm gonna do that for this sport profile. Um, and you can again, change this how you see fit. The one thing I wanna point out is this one called Ultra Track there. Don't, don't use that profile, that's not good. Um, so that profile is for ultra long battery life, but it has, horrific GPS tracks. It basically like cuts across things. It pretty much only records for about 20 seconds every two or three minutes. Uh, so as a general rule of thumb, if you need this ultra track uh, option here, like you're going across this is hard desert, just bring yourself a battery pack, like a USB battery pack, a single USB lipstick style battery pack would last you to go across the entire Sahara desert, like walking slowly. Um, I mean, it's just, you're only talking a, uh, maybe four to 600 milliamp battery in this. Those lipstick chargers have like 3000 milliamps. So uh, again, uh, you don't, you don't want to use this mode. If you do, you just don't, no, you just don't use it. Okay. Um, so going on back here, if you wanted to add a structure workout, you press this middle left hand button again, you go down here to training, uh, and then I can choose a quick workout or a workout library. These are some of the structure workouts that I have on there. So this eight by one uh, test right there, I can view the steps. You can see a warm up run, recover, uh, repeat it two to three, eight times. And this was run uh, three to three, 30 a kilometer. So that's like, I don't know, it's fast. That's all, that's all I know in terms of minutes a mile. Uh, and then also you can go down and go back here. Sorry, I can see my training calendar. I can see pace pro plans, race against myself and so on. And these are all things that you can customize on the watch directly or from the Garmin Connect IQ app or Garmin Sorry Connect app, uh, or from a training plan that's pushed to your watch automatically. Uh, and the same is true for navigation. 
So if I tap on navigation here, I can load up uh, different courses, for example. I can go and see what's around me, points of interest. I can navigate different components. And we'll talk about navigation in just a second. So we'll get back to that. Don't worry about that. Uh, going on back here, I'm going to go ahead and start my run. I tap this. I don't know GPS, but that's all right for the moment. And then if I go down, I can see these are my data pages that I set up. Uh, and I can just, you know, tap on through this like that. Uh, and there's that map page there as well. I can make a lap by pressing this lower right hand button. It creates a lap marker. I can also have automatic laps if I want to, uh, based on distance or time. And then if I was in a structured workout, it would iterate through that workout automatically. And again, if I was navigating somewhere, it would go ahead and show me those navigation steps that we'll talk about in just a second. So I'm going to stop this here by pressing this upper right hand button. And then I'm going to go ahead and just uh, delete this out by choosing to discard it at the end. Normally, though, at the end of a workout, it'll show you a summary of your workout. Here's a picture of that right there. And you can tap through and see a bunch of different workout metrics if you want to. So all those workout metrics are there to go ahead and see. Keeping in mind that this, what you see on the watch is just a small fraction of what you actually have. Uh, instead, the Garmin Connect app shows you way more metrics. And you can see a picture of those on the screen right now. And even what I'm showing you on the screen is a fraction of what I can actually show you because like, I'd have to have like 30 screenshots to show you it all there. And that's just too much to show on in one little screen. One last quick thing to note on sports. If you need a pair of sensors, uh, middle left hand button right there, go on down to sensors all the way down there, the sensors and accessories. Uh, I turn off auto discover because I'm uh, always riding with other people and things like that. Uh, this will automatically discover other sensors nearby. I like this off. Uh, choose though, add new, and then you can choose a sensor type that you want to go ahead and pair. So you can see all the different sensor types there. Uh, both AMP Plus and Bluetooth smart sensors are supported here. Uh, going on down, you can see all the sensors I've paired. You can save multiple types of a given sensor or multiple sensors of a given type. So multiple power meters there, uh, shifting, and then you can choose a wrist-based heart rate there as well. Uh, you can you know, configure how you want the settings on that. Uh, so which sports you want it in, you can choose to broadcast it. Uh, and you can also choose to broadcast automatically per sport profile. So I've got a setup when I'm in the indoor bike profile, uh, I choose to go ahead and automatically broadcast my heart rate from my wrist over AMP Plus and Bluetooth Smart. So to show that very, very quickly here, go tap sport profile, we'll go down to bike indoor, there we go. And then in the settings here, there we go, boop, uh, bike indoor settings. Oops, I just added my smart trainer over there, sorry. Uh, did not want to do that. Bike indoor settings here. Go backwards, it's faster this way to get to it. And then you see broadcast heart rate is on. This means every time I start this profile up, it'll go ahead and broadcast the heart rate so that I can you know, pair it to it on Zwift or something like that. Now I want to briefly show you the training plan bits here a little bit more in depth. Uh, so if I just, so back up here to run, I tap into this again. And what it's going to show here is today's daily suggested workout. Basically for today is suggesting rest. I had a reasonable day of workouts yesterday, not that hard, uh, but relative for the last few days, it's been a really busy last few days. And so it's saying, hey, just rest today. Now these daily suggested workouts or DSWs as Garmin calls them, uh, are going to be for running and cycling. Uh, and they're going to take into account any training plans that you've loaded in here, as well as any uh, goals that you have from a race standpoint. So you can add a race to your calendar, and then you can add the exact day, you can add the exact course, all that kind of stuff. And that will one, go ahead and start giving you daily suggested workouts for that. In fact, it'll give you everything, including a base phase for your uh, training plan, a build phase, uh, a peaking phase, and then a taper phase, and then a recovery after that event. It's pretty impressive for both running and cycling, not for triathlon though. So if you load a triathlon event there, it just goes like, I don't have to do with this. Uh, so it has to be running or cycling. Uh, so if I just tap to open up run again, you can see that same suggested workout. But if I choose this up here in the corner, I can see more suggestions or settings. I'm gonna go to more suggestions for a second and I can see what's coming up for the next few days. So tomorrow I've got a threshold workout, Thursday I've got a base workout, Friday base, Saturday base, and so on. Uh, now right now, this is actually officially recovery phase from the event that I had scheduled, a fake event if you will, this past weekend uh, to match my wife's Ironman race. So I just put it on there. Uh, but if I go down here and look at, uh, let's see, threshold right now, uh, you can see this is what it has for the threshold workout. But if I go back here and go all the way down to settings, what's cool is that I can change some of the settings for the different automatically suggested workouts. I can choose the workout prompt on or off, which is what I have right there. But I can go down again and say, what day do I have my long workouts on? And I can say I want to be uh, Monday or Tuesday, or right now you can see I've got Saturday and Sunday selected. I go back again. 
I can change the target pace type. Uh, in this case, it's pace or heart rate. Uh, there's not running power supported. In the case of cycling, it's going to be cycling power, uh, but not for running power. I can pause training if I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm injured now, whatever the case is, I can go and pause this as well. And now in my case, because I'm at the end of the event that was scheduled for this past weekend, I can't see my phases ahead. But here's a little snippet of video footage from a few weeks ago that shows those phases on the watch, basically showing that build phase and the peak phase and so on in the timeframes for that. If I added a new calendar event to my uh, watch, I would start to see those same calendar phases. So I could add something in August or you know a few months from now uh, and then be able to see those phases start to build out again. Now that we've talked about training a little bit, let's go back and look at those training readiness scores. So here I am on the watch face, again, tap down, and you see training readiness. Right now it shows me in the green at 62 at moderate. If I tap this open, you can see I am ready for the day, it says. Uh, now, training readiness is as the name implies, like literally as the name implies, your readiness to train at this very second. Uh, assuming my day is calm, it, it won't be, uh, but assuming my day is calm, this number will continue to climb over time. Uh, but if I go out and do a hard interval workout right now, it's gonna plummet back down into the orange or red because I'm no longer ready to train after that interval workout. Likewise, if I stay up all night's night working on a review for tomorrow, then this number will basically drop as well because I've got no sleep and thus my readiness to train is low. If I go tap down, you can see the factors here. These are the core factors that basically contribute to your training readiness. Uh, sleep being the most important, recovery time being the second most important, HRV status, acute load, which is your training load, we'll talk about that in a second too, and sleep history and stress history. So you can see my sleep from last night, this is last night's metric, is fair, because uh, again, only about six hours, 15 minutes of sleep uh, and shorter than ideal. And then my recovery time is low, about 10 hours left from yesterday's interval run before my swim. And then HRV status, as we showed earlier, is balanced. Uh, and go down again. Acute load is optimal, but at the lower end. And this will be important when we talk about why I'm in unproductive for training status. Uh, so because I'm at the lower end at my normal range for acute load, because the last few weeks have been kind of hectic. Sleep history here. This is looking at the last seven days of your sleep history. You can see it's all over the map. So I've had some, some bad nights in there and stuff, which makes sense. I've had lots of travel, which has been kind of wonky. So this is why this is in uh, fair and orange. And then stress history is medium. Uh, so some stressful days. Uh, apparently, you know, Sunday was pretty stressful. That was the day my wife did a race. That was a, that was a heck of a day. So that was stressful. Uh, chasing her around for you know, a, the whole day, literally, I uh, woke up at four in the morning and then we're up till midnight. So it was a very, very long day. And I would say, you know, way more stressful for her, but certainly stressful for me as well. Um, so these are the factors that, you know, contribute to my training readiness. I find the training readiness score to be very well implemented here. It's a very good job of balancing different components. Again, as I mentioned, sleep and that recovery time are the most important components in terms of your score. Uh, if I don't sleep tonight or if I get off a plane and have no sleep, this score will be down in the red, the single digits likely. Uh, but right now it's, it's a pretty decent score because my load uh, is relatively low, my recovery is relatively high, and I've had decent sleep for at least the last few days. So how is that different than training status? So if I go back here and I go down, you'll see training status. If you've had a Garmin watch for a while, you're familiar with training status. It's a thing that well, always shows you unproductive. But in most cases, there's good reason for that. Uh, now, Garmin watches of yesteryear before the you know, Phoenix 7 Epix uh, series, so basically more than 18 months or so ago, uh, they were more reliant on just training status versus training readiness is about, again, are you ready to train right now? Training status is like your coach. In other words, is the training that you're doing going to be productive to your long-term goals? Uh, so they've kind of separated out those things. And so you see here, my VO2 max is decreasing because I haven't done much in the interval workout realm the last few weeks. I've done some pretty epic workouts the last few weeks, but not so much intervals. That really tends to help uh, my VO2 max. My HRV status is balanced, which is good. My optimal load is good, but it's low on the scale. So if I tap this open, you can see here, your overall training load looks good, but your fitness is declining. Try focusing on rest, nutrition, and stress management, turn things around. Uh, again, these are all relatively correct components. I've had crappy sleep lately, some stressful few days. Uh, my training load is lower than my volume for the last six months or so. And that makes sense because I was training uh, for a big race that had three or four weeks ago. And then since then I'm in like the recovery phase, uh, the early summer enjoying summer phase. Uh, and so if we look down, if we go down here, you can see acute load is low on my range. Uh, and this is called the tunnel, this green section right there, the optimal load. And right now my tunnel is roughly from, I don't know, like 600 
to 1200. Uh, but in you know May, so a month or so ago, my tunnel extended up to about 2100. So that, my trending load was way, way higher because I was trending for that race uh, and versus now my tunnel continues to decrease. And the tunnel is mostly based on uh, the last four weeks of activity. So if I tap into this, you can see it's in the optimal range, but it's not really, not really great. Person. You can see load focus here. So this is balanced, basically different components, uh, essentially different types of workouts that you have. So, you know, longer distance, easier workout ones, uh, harder ones that are more interval or aerobic focused. And I'm actually balanced for once in my life on here, uh, looking at the last four weeks. Tapping back here, going down, you can see VO2 max is apparently declining a little bit. You know, I piked up here about three weeks ago, and then now the last few weeks, I just haven't had a lot of workouts to really drive my VO2 max numbers. Uh, going down again, HRV status, like I showed earlier, recovery hours. I've got heat acclimation uh, from some, you know, workouts and some hotter days here recently. And then altitude acclimation because I've been in Colorado a bunch uh, the last uh, week or so. Therefore, I was sleeping at altitude and I'm acclimating to that particular altitude. And you can see this here on the chart there. So let's go back and look at two more scores here, uh, which is endurance score and hill score. These are two scores that are new on the Epics Pro and Phoenix Pro series. You can see my endurance score there is at 80, or sorry, 7,800. I tap into that. And you can see here's what it's done over the last few months there. Uh, now, the endurance score is basically looking at how good you are going longer durations. Uh, that's, that's its main focus there. Uh, and the goal behind this, what Garmin says, is that up until now, most of Garmin's metrics are really focused very, very heavily on uh, heart rate ones in cycling and running. And if you did other sports, you wouldn't necessarily get credit for that in some of the different training kind of metrics. But here you do an endurance score and a way to see that over time. Uh, you can see as I built up here to early June, that was sort of my build uh, into my race. And then since then, I had a couple, you know, a week or so in June where I'm doing some kind of crazy activities. Uh, and then since then, it's been tapering down a bit as I've had all this travel. Uh, now, it's gone down from what was roughly about 82 or so has its peak uh, down a bit lower. Uh, and if I tap into this, you can see the last four weeks has been lower than usual um, over these last four weeks, which causes cause a decline in endurance score. Uh, despite that, you're, you know, stroll strong level and bounce back with more training. Uh, now, I think broadly speaking, what Garmin's doing with endurance score makes sense. But at the like individual workout level, there's just a lot of wonk that I see that just does not make sense at all. Like things that, I don't think their algorithms are doing it correctly yet. Uh, so for example, um, a week or two ago, I did a hour and a half or two hours, something like that trail run. I gained, I don't know, whatever it was, like 3000 feet of vertical uh, in a matter of like 70 minutes. So like really, really uh, impressive vertical gain. Uh, and then the next day I did essentially the same thing again. In both of those cases, I gained one unit of endurance score. Yet I've gone for a 30 minute swim, an easy like shellac swim and gained 50 units. I did a trainer ride the day before that, super easy trainer ride, just testing some power stuff. And I gained 50 units as well. Like it doesn't make sense sometimes. And again, broadly speaking, I agree with the generality of the score, but if those individual components are wrong, then I'm not sure the score is really right at all. And so, not really like super game on that. Uh, next though is hill score, also introduced here uh, as well. Uh, and you can see the hill score is basically judging you for your pedestrian based activities going up a hill. And those are key things there. One, no cycling is included. This is purely like foot things. So running, hiking, trail running, etc. cetera. Uh, and then purely going up hills. It doesn't judge you for how fast you go down hills. Uh, and so if I tap into this, you can see the different components here. Uh, hill endurance. So how good am I at going for long distances, just like going and going and going and going up a hill, and then hill strength, how fast do I go up that hill, and then my VO2 max. Uh, and if I go back here again, oops, sorry, I uh, go down here again, down further, there we go, you can see my hill score. Now the one bummer here is that despite wearing this watch this entire time, uh, every time I reset my watch or get a new watch, it doesn't save my older history beyond the last 30 days. So this is like a reset of the watch there and it pulls in the old data, kind of super frustrating. Uh, so every time I've had to reset the watch, I've lost my older data. Uh, in any case, uh, basically my hill score started off with 86 and it's been slowly declining since then. It started off at 86 because I hiked up a giant 8,000 foot mountain uh, in one go, in one you know 40K go over eight hours. And then since then it's been slowly declining. I've been managed to like save it a bit uh, by some other relatively epic uh, hikes, but I live in the Netherlands, so everything is a pancake flat. So every time I go out and run, 
I lose money, lose money. I lose hill score value. It's kind of kind of a sad thing uh, because they're basically saying no, it's it's more flat flat terrain, uh, and that's fair. I get it. Uh, again, I think hill score is broadly where it needs to be, but I'm not convinced in some of these top end categories. I start off at 86, as I said. Uh, if I was to say if, not, if 100 is the top end and 86 is where I was, I am not a pro level trail runner uh, like people that you know do that for a living. So I would think there'd be a wider you know space between 86 and 100 if you were to talk about like you know a top end, the world's best uh, trail runners uh, that you know do hill climbing and. To me, that should be more than just that, but that's that. Uh, any case, that is hill score and endurance score. Uh, at this point, we're going to go ahead and dive into mapping and navigation. So, go on back here. Uh, I'm going to tap into this. I'm going to go down to hike real quick here. Find a hike. Eh, we'll just do trail run. Fine. There we go. Trail run. Tap this open. Uh, there's that today's suggestion again. And on the left-hand side, I can choose here to go ahead and navigate. Uh, and this is on virtually all GPS activity uh, options. And then within that, I can choose point of interest, around me, courses, activities, save locations, site and go, coordinates, and use the map. The idea being that in the case of, for example, point of interest, I can say, hey, where is uh, this monument at the top of a hill or nearby, whatever you want it to be. I can look at a database of those points of interest. Uh, I can find, you know, for example, uh, these are kind of like car based ones in a lot of ways, but uh, on the bike computer side, they've redone some of these, uh, but I can find different things, food and drink nearby, a cafe, uh, whatever the case is, and navigate directly to that. For most people, yeah, I'm going to go back here, but for most people, you're going to go ahead and navigate a course. So I'm going to show you that instead. Going on back again. There we go. Courses. Now, these are all courses that I've saved and loaded in there. Uh, so you can see each one of these courses uh, has different things there. And I'm going to pull up this one I did uh, a couple weeks ago. So this is about a 30K course. I'm going to tap this open and I can see the elevation profile and I can see the course map. Uh, and this is where I can go and fall on the watch. So I could do the course right away, but I'm gonna look at the map first and show you that map. And you can see the map here, that red line is the course profile, so I can zoom in. And you'll notice the shading on this map here, that's new with the uh, Phoenix 7. Might be a little too bright for you to see, sorry. The screen is just super bright here. But now you can see a little bit better there, uh, the shading on that, the relief shading. So if I go ahead and I can use my finger to move it around here. This is a trail run uh, I did. Super awesome, beautiful trail run. Here's some pictures. I can see the course here, course profile, using the maps. Uh, the way it works with maps on the Epix and Phoenix Pro series is that you have uh, maps that are preloaded. So basically your country region that you bought it in, but then you can add additional maps to it for free uh, using either Wi-Fi on the watch or using your computer to go ahead and download those maps use your computer, uh, unless you have a lot of time. If you have a lot of time and you have a Wi-Fi access point that's close by, as long as it's an open one, like you'd have at home, so it can't be like a hotel style one, then sure, use Wi-Fi. Generally speaking, downloading an entire region, like all of North America or Europe, uh, is about 10 to 12 gigs, give or take. And that'll take about three to four hours using Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi on this watch is not optimized uh, for speed. It's optimized for battery life savings. Uh, so you still have to plug it in to download, uh, but it just will take a long time. So if you do it on a computer, it's going to take between, in my case, 20 to 30 minutes tops to download all that. So much better uh, way to do it that way. Now, I can also look here at my elevation plot and I can look at the view climbs. This is my favorite because this is showing climb pro. So if I go back to elevation plot real quick to show you this first, and then I'll go back to view climbs, uh, you can see the elevation profile for this hike. This is the beast, by the way. Uh, so this was uh, 5,000 feet or so of climbing, uh, a very, very solid day of climbs. You can see that there. Uh, go on back here and go down to the view climbs. And this is where I can see each one of the climbs along the way. So the distance for that climb, 0.41 kilometers, uh, and the elevation profile. I've mixed up my elevation profile right now, so I've got, or mixed up my metrics. So I've got feet for elevation, and I've got uh, distance in kilometers, just to, to keep it real, I guess. Um, going on down, you can see each one of these, I just tap down here, both the climbs and the descents. So, you know, some of these are some, you know, bigger climbs here, but this is a lot of ups and downs on this, uh, and it's gonna go ahead, and I'm eventually, I've got some big ones here. So, you know, 500 feet going up there, uh, some, there we go. Uh, 1,200 feet going down, uh, that's gonna hurt, that did hurt, uh, and so on. And going through this entire list here uh, of the total ascents and so on. 
interesting little bug, by the way, of 13 of two climbs. Uh, should be 22, but somehow it's being cut off there. Uh, and again, these are all the climbs of the day. I absolutely love Climb Pro when you're out and hiking. So once you were to start this, you would see Climb Pro for each of these climbs. My, one of my favorite, if not my favorite Garmin feature, uh, where basically it shows you how much time and distance is left for the top, shows you the average gradient over uh, that climb, and shows you what's upcoming. It's amazing. I do a lot of uh, hiking that tends to be mountain-based, uh, where I'm just you know climbing epic climbs. And so to be able to see how much distance and time and my grade remaining, uh, the gradient uh, on the screen there remaining is incredibly useful uh, and so that is you know one of my favorite features that's only if you load a course though so you have to either load a course or you have to choose you're not to be navigating so you have to choose a point at the top for example and then it'll load that uh, but it has to have be navigating in some capacity so unlike garmin cycling computers that have basically a freestyle climb pro that's not on the watches at this point in time now, while I'm outside of navigating, what you're going to see on the watch is basically uh, your trail that you're going to see going there. You're going to see the distance that you see there uh, to your next fork. Um, that's notable because what next fork is showing you is the next time the trail does some sort of junction, even if you're not doing anything at that junction. You'll also see how long until your next churn, but that's useful because it just makes you aware of things coming up. And what's cool about the next fork feature is that does not have to have any sort of a navigation load uh, because sometimes the trail, you know, it may make a fork. You may not even notice it because something is overgrown, whatever the case is, and you missed your turn entirely. So it's a cool little feature that just shows you what's upcoming. If you go off course, it's going to notify you that you're off course uh, and it'll tell you how to get back on course again. Uh, and then again, it'll also show you the distance remaining uh, for your overall course, as well as any waypoints that you have upcoming. Uh, now, just to very quickly show you how to access maps, I'm going to go all the way back here, or how to access map downloads, middle left-hand button, go on down, and we will find map. There we go. And then map manager. Yep, we can choose that. And we have two different categories, outdoor plus maps or top active maps. Outdoor plus maps are Garmin's paid subscription maps. And now, while there's lots of fears about Garmin, like, doing paid subscription maps, Garmin's been doing that for 15 years. Like, literally, been doing that for way before everyone else got in the whole subscription uh, map thing there. What is included for free is the top active maps, which is what I use, versus Outdoor Maps Plus is things like satellite imagery and specialty maps, a lot of really custom maps. You can do that there. But I just use top active maps, which are free. And you can see there's updates available here for my European ones and my North American ones. Or I can go down here and I can choose to add a map. It's going to search for Wi-Fi. It's going to populate the list of maps. And then I can choose to download one of those maps onto the watch. It's really as easy as that. Now, instead of waiting for this to search for that, let's talk about the flashlight, because that's a little bit more fun. So on the Epic series, it now has a flashlight. So if I just double tap this right here, you'll see that turn that red light on right there. Uh, and this is true for all the units. Uh, they do have different levels of brightness though, so do keep that in mind. Uh, you can see this on the screen right now, the comparative brightness levels between the three different watches side by side. Uh, now the way the flashlight works to activate it or to access it is the upper left-hand button. Just hold that for a second and you get in the controls menu. Uh, and I didn't mention this earlier on, but this is the controls menu. Basically it's kind of a quick access way to get to anything you want. You can see the flashlight option right there. And then there's this kind of uh, control there. So if I go up like this, uh, you can see if you watch now, I'm just going to show you on the both sides here. It's going to go ahead and make it brighter uh, up to four levels of brightness. This is a really bright flashlight. Obviously, you're in a bright studio right now. But, you know, this is basically on par with my iPhone flashlight, um, you know, different at its fullest brightness level, uh, except it's on my wrist all the time. It's super handy. It's one of those things that, you know, you're thinking like Inspector Gadget style, but what's great about the flashlight is just like the middle of the night. As I mentioned a bunch of times now, I've been traveling a ton lately and I'm in hotel rooms. I don't know like how to get to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Uh, having on the red light mode is my default. That's why when you saw me turn on the very first time, it was a red light mode. Uh, this is great for just getting around the middle of the night. Great for helping out little kids in the middle of the night. Just anything you want to do in the middle of the night, it's awesome for. Uh, and it just makes it really easy. I can tap this to turn on or off there. Again, up here as well on or off, and it always retains your last setting. So I'm gonna go back to red light mode. So tonight when I go to Frankfurt for Eurobike, I'm not gonna blind, blind myself on the full flatness light when I turn that on later on the night. So that is a flashlight, super awesome stuff. Uh, again, a great little feature to have on all the Epix ranges now, uh, as well as just on the Epix itself. Now the last thing I wanna to touch on is contactless payments, as well as music. So here's my contactless payment reader. We will get this started up right now. Now this is called Garmin Pay and it basically uses your NFC payment. Now, now this is called Garmin Pay and allows you to load your credit card onto your watch. 
your credit card does have to be supported by your bank. So it's not all Visa cards or all Amex cards, wherever the case is. Uh, it's whatever banks they support. Garmin has a giant uh, list on their website of all banks across all countries. Uh, in the U.S., it's very widely supported. Outside the U.S., it's kind of hit or miss. Uh, so in my case, I added my U.S. credit card. It takes just a couple seconds to add it to the Garmin Connect app. Uh, once that's all done, you go ahead and hold this upper left-hand button, and you can find that little credit card icon over here. There we go. And we tap that, and then I enter my secret passcode. Can't be showing you that. And then now it's ready to go ahead and pay. Uh, now, what's nice about this is that'll save you. You want to enter the passcode as long as you keep it on your wrist. Once you take it off your wrist, you have to enter the passcode again. Now, I've got a payment reader right here. I'm just going to go ahead and charge myself a dollar for my own water bottle. Uh, I'm going to use the card reader. There we go. And you can see the card reader is here. Uh, oops, sorry, tap that card reader again over there. Now it's going to communicate with it just like you would at a grocery store. Uh, and you can use this anywhere you would uh, use NFC payments. So any grocery store, whatever the case is, uh, card reader ending wasn't found. I have to update my card reader. One moment, please. For more update for my card reader. Who knew? Uh, this is supposed to take 39 minutes. So we'll get back to that in a second. And uh, instead, I'll talk about music. So music, well, that does its thing over there. So the way this works with music is you can put streaming music on there, like Spotify, Amazon Music, Deezer, etc., Or you can put MP3 files as well as podcasts. In my case, I'm a Spotify kind of guy. So I'm going to go down to the music widget. So go on down here a little bit further. There we go. Spotify. There we go. Crack this open. Spotify. And now I can add music. Uh, so in this case, I can go and look at my recently played, my playlists. I'll choose my playlist right here. Uh, and this will pull up all my playlists from my account. Uh, so including the ones that my wife makes, that my kids make, and they're all going to be here. So you can see these lists right here. My wife made this one right here, this Pump Jams one. Uh, it's a great one to show though because it's only got 24 tracks in it, so it won't take very long to download. I can choose this, and now it'll go ahead and search for the Wi-Fi network. Uh, now it needs Wi-Fi to download your music, but once it's downloaded, you don't need to be near Wi-Fi, cellular, or anything. That's the whole idea is that you can take your headphones, you can take your watch, go out into the wilderness, and listen to music without anything on there. Uh, you do have to check in every 30 days, meaning that you have to open Spotify up every 30 days. So it goes ahead and it validates you still have an active Spotify subscription, uh, but it's really as easy as that. Now it does note that for the best performance, put it next to your Wi-Fi router. That is definitely true. Like I know a lot of warning messages you just ignore, but this would be way faster if I took this watch, walked around the corner, put it on top of the laundry machine, which is where the Wi-Fi router is, router, router is, uh, and then be faster. But you can see it's already 8-9% complete, given the fact that this is only 24 songs, it won't take that long. Uh, you can see it chugging along there. My guess is it will take about a minute and a half or so to do those 24 songs, uh, and not too bad. Obviously, if you're downloading something that was like 400 songs, you probably want to go ahead and uh, you know plug it in so it doesn't burn as much battery. And what's cool though is if you were to cancel this, like I'm gonna cancel this right now, the songs that's already downloaded will stay there. So watch this, cancel this. Yep, cancel sync, no problem. And going back here, so playlists. There we go, and you can see I've got 13 of the 24 tracks downloaded. Uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and choose, this is gonna be a quick little UI how to do this. Skip, blah, 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 no problem. And I choose play there, and it's gonna say connect headphones. Uh, now I had removed these headphones from this, so I search for headphones. You just do pairing like normal. In my case, I'm gonna hold this little red button down for a couple seconds to put it in Bluetooth pairing mode. Okay, we see the Beats Studio Buds there. Click choose to add that. Okay, we got those connected. And then once it's connected, it'll automatically start playing. Uh, you can go ahead and pause if you like right there. Uh, you can go ahead and hit this to skip to the next track. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward. You can probably hear it here on the microphone. I don't want to get a copyright strike though, but there you go. Very, very easy to use. Uh, again, the goal here isn't to be able to like choose individual songs whenever you want in the watch. Just to be able to go ahead and just play a playlist and skip through it, and stop, change volume, all that. Uh, I can do that here. You can change shuffle. You can change repeat previous, volume, uh, and library. And you can also control those from your headphones depending on what your headphone supports. Uh, now, as for the reader, uh, I will show you a little video of me tapping that. That's, that. that's all it was left, right? I just take the watch and I tap the reader just like you would at a grocery store. Given this still has, well, it had 40 minutes and then it crashed the app, so it's pretty awesome. But uh, here is a video of me tapping the reader and showing you what it looks like, hopefully. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. And with that, we've reached the end of the video. It's as simple as that. Uh, if you found this video interesting or useful, definitely whack that like button at the bottom there. It really does help with the video and the channel quite a bit. Also, fun fact, this is the second time I've recorded this. The first time I recorded it over a month ago, but I, I was traveling and I did it on a chairlift. I know it's odd. And then when I got all that done and started editing it, it turns out that chairlift was moving like this. Just very, 
very slowly, which made me seasick. And that was me trying to edit it, let alone you trying to watch it. So I, I shot the whole thing again. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it, despite that would have been a really cool video if the chairlift hadn't been moving. Anyways, have a good one.